Simon, let's uh, let's get right into it. What are the benefits of turmeric for longevity, inflammation, and weight loss? Those are the three things that people always ask me about. So in whatever way you want to answer that, let's get stuck into the, the benefits of turmeric. Well, of the three, inflammation does seem to be the core. And we know that inflammation is the basis of pretty much every problem that goes on in the body. We think of inflammation as itis, you know, cystitis and bronchitis and so on. But we now understand inflammation is the basis for aging, for uh, cancer, for uh, chronic diseases of all sorts. So if we can find something that reduces the level of inflammation in the body, Mm. then we can start projecting it further forward. Now, we're talking about turmeric, and uh, turmeric is an extraordinary remedy. It's an extraordinary food. We all know it because we have it in our curries, that yellow stuff. And, you know, if there's a factory that's producing turmeric products, they have to have a separate annex because everyone goes in wearing spacesuit masks because they come out yellow. Right, you know, yeah, stains yeah. everything and, you know, you don't want your white linen suit anywhere near it. Um, <laughs> so it's we all know it because of the yellowness of it. And we know it, if anyone ever has been to Asia, uh, we know that they have it all day and every day, you know, from breakfast through to dinner as as part of their spice-rich foods. So it's probably the, I would think of it as the queen of the spices. Um, it's, it's the one that probably has the most uh, research around it. It's the most puzzling, um, but I think there's also a very exciting prospect emerging. So turmeric is something that people eat in large quantities in Asia, um, mm. and uh, it's two to five grams a day by the average person living in India. Two to five, five grams. grams of wow. turmeric okay. every day. So that's a, a heap teaspoonful mm. in effect. And if you compare with what we're eating, you know, unless we're really fond of our Indian, uh, nights out in the curry house, yeah. Uh, yeah. we probably don't get anywhere near that. And people worry about, well, can we have too much of it? That's the first answer. Mm-hmm. People do eat a lot of it. It's mm-hmm. safe. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then uh, everyone then wor- uh, worries about the fact that it contains curcumin and you find people selling supplements in turmeric that are high in curcumin, that are, ba- that are powerful because they've got better absorbed curcumin. Uh, the difficulty is, is that curcumin does not get absorbed okay. from the gut, from the digestive system, uh, 1%, 2% max. Uh, it's because it's a clumpy molecule, we call it a polyphenol. It's a sort of a molecule you get in all fruits and vegetables and vegetables. They're one of the key ways in which they're healthy. Curcumin is one of those. It's a very important nutrient, mm. but it does not get into the tissues. So you can improve the absorption bit by mixing it with what people do is black pepper. Um, and so you, that's routinely done to improve the absorption. It may be moves it from one and a half to 3% absorption, you know, okay. so it doubles it, but it's still pretty small. Gotcha. Uh, almost certainly get the same benefit by mixing with ginger or with any other spice. And you get the mix, you get the theme here. Essentially, when you're having turmeric, you're not having it on its own. Mm. You're having it with all these other ones and with cumin and coriander and all the others. It's the mixture that seems to be the key. Uh, But that's still a puzzle. You're still only getting a very small part of curcumin into the body, which is probably just as well because it's not very safe in high quantities. Uh, If it was to be injected, for example, it could do you some harm. So there's a reason why nature does it that way. Keeps the curcumin in the gut, in the digestion. So the next question is, is it doing any good there? And the answer is absolutely. And the more we look at it, the more we realize that actually you don't need to absorb curcumin. You don't need to absorb turmeric. It's doing all the goodness in the gut, in the gut. Okay. particularly with those bacteria, the healthy bacteria that live low down there. We call it the microbiome. Everyone's getting very excited about it because for a very good reason. You know, We know that there's 10 times as many cells in the microbiome than there are in the rest of us probably a hundred times as many genes in there. So it's a very powerful part of us, Mm. but it's sort of in a way outside us. It's, it's, It's in its own compartment. So what we understand now is that the microbiome is talking to the rest of the body through the gut wall. And there's this conversation going on. The gut wall supports the microbiome. The microbiome, when it's well, produces products that then the gut wall 
uh, uh, makes the gut wall healthier, protects the gut wall integrity, mm-hmm. uh, and then f- feeds the rest of the body likewise. The thing about curcumin and these polyphenols, as I said, they're very large, clumpy molecules that can't get in through in, through the wall. What the microbiome does, which is really exciting, and this is for all the plant polyphenols, is it breaks them up mm. into small molecules. We call them phenols. If you want an example of a very well-known phenol, aspirin is a simple phenol, and we all know what that how powerful mm. that can be. What the microbiome does is it converts plant foods into lots of aspirin-like breakdown products, gotcha. which easily move through the gut wall mm-hmm. because they're small mm. and they, they're sort of hyperactive. They're like you know, you know fast BMW type uh, <laughs> actors. They move quickly through the through these tissues, and almost certainly the effects on the circulation and on inflammation is from these small molecules. But the other thing that the uh, the curcumin and the turmeric and particularly does we now have evidence for is that it actually reduces other pro- sources of inflammation that come from the food from the gut from the digestive system and most inflammation begins in the gut when you think about it because yeah. that's where all the foreign stuff comes in yeah so if we can find a way of reducing the inflammatory load shall we say the, the stuff that the p- troublesome stuff that can gum from the our innards into the rest of the body, then we're beginning to start talking. Yeah. And so the clever thinking is that turmeric and indeed the other spices, because we now ginger and cinnamon, cumin, cardamom, uh, all seem to be working in the same way. They they like they have these polyphenols, these phytonutrients in buckets, they're very high concentrated. So it looks as though they're, they're plants on steroids, so to speak, mm, you know, they're yeah. really much more powerful. You only need small amounts to have the effect of a large meal, you know, so the spices can really add real value. And the turmeric is likely to work indirectly from its effects on yeah. the gut. So if we reduce inflammation, then other things follow. So you mentioned longevity. Well, yeah. clearly longevity is all about cell damage and tissue damage and breakdown of as the years roll by. Well, if you can reduce your inflammation, you increase the life of your tissues and the rest of you. Um, and almost, I mean, uh, I want to keep eating spices. I'm already 103, as you can tell. So <laughs> I'm going to carry on eating spices just to keep going yeah. uh, because they are the most concentrated way in which you can sort of reduce some of these burdens, these problems. Just before we dive into um, some of the benefits of reducing inflammation a bit more, I think just to pause there for the listener or viewer, just to reiterate that when you consume something and you put something into your digestive tract, it's still technically outside your body even though it's inside your body if you see what i mean so it hasn't crossed that that uh, barrier into your bloodstream and so what your gut is doing is essentially being the the gatekeeper of what is allowed into your body into into your true body i into your bloodstream um, and breaking it down appropriately as needed to, to facilitate that. Absolutely so. And just as well, isn't it? Uh, that yeah. We have that protection because, you know, we eat all sorts of stuff. <laughs> and if we didn't have a good digestive system, we'd blow up. Um, uh, there was a, a, a H.G. Wells, you know, the science fiction writer, yeah. who was a scientist before he, well, as well as writing books, he remarked that if he uh, fed his hamsters with egg they would be fine if he injected them with egg they'd die Mm. what was the difference Mm. it was the digestive system breaks down and makes safe a food which if it would it got into the bloodstream uh would be dangerous yeah so protein if it got into the bloodstream the body would think it was an immune immune threat you know like giving the wrong blood transfusion Mm. you know Mm. so uh, the 
we depend on the digestion to, as you say, to keep the food on the outside until it's ready to be taken yeah. in. Yeah. And, it's, uh, and the what, microbiome is a large part of that, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. And what you mentioned actually about the absorbability of certain turmeric preparations, whether it's curcumin, certain curcuminoids, the whole turmeric itself, I actually didn't realize A, how low the absorption is, and B, how low the absorption is still in absolute terms despite the addition of you know, black pepper yeah. or ginger or peppery and all. There, there, are, there are there's some quite clever things. There's a, there's a product that has fenugreek, by the way, which ah, is, a, which okay. is another Indian. Yeah, um, we use that a lot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which uh, apparently brings curcumin over a bit more. Oh, wow. And there's high bioavailability of curcumin, my colleague, who's very keen on that, oh. um, to bump up the levels a bit. Uh, but he and I do agree that you know there's still a huge place for curcumin outside the body so to speak still in the digestive yeah. yeah 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 so that that's i think that would be my starting point mm -hmm. you know how can we improve the function of the gut and its protective benefits and then diabetes longevity you name it let's mm. start the ball running uh, the other thing that i would add is i've already mentioned pepper and ginger and cayenne and uh, cardamom they're all uh, hot spices. They have that bite to them, don't mm. they? Uh, and th there's a certain molecule attached to them. They're all slightly different, but they basically feel hot. Um, and the reason they work is because they're tickling your pain fibers. I mean, it's literally, that's what generates the heat. So these things, including turmeric, feel hot by tickling these fibers, mainly in the mouth, and mm. throat, and gullet. And what happens is you get a reflex increase in blood flow. So the feeling of heat is actually an illusion. You're not actually burning. You're just tickling those pain fibers. Uh -huh. Of course, if you had a really powerful uh, spice, you know, chili, whatever, food of Indaloo or whatever, that does feel as though your head blowing off. Yeah. But in fact, it is illusion nevertheless. Uh -huh. And what you're getting, and this is the important thing, you're getting this increased blood supply. Mm -hmm in the wall of the digestive system first, but then by reflex through the rest of the body. Mm -hmm. And we know that what that's doing is, is it's improving the way in which the blood vessels work, which is another place of importance for all sorts of illnesses, conditions. Uh, so we can add that before it gets anywhere in the body, mm -hmm. turmeric is already kicking off the blood supply mm -hmm. simply because it's a spice, yeah, like yeah. these other ones. And so concerns that people might have for particular supplements, so they have very uh, highly potent or purified forms of the chemicals that are perhaps in their phenolic form rather than the polyphenol form, i.e., you know, uh, the, the more metabolized uh, versions. Are there any safety concerns for those kind of supplements versus the whole turmeric? Well, this is where we start getting more and more into the unknown. Uh -huh. You see, what I always answer is, what did people do mm. and what have they done for centuries or millennia in mm. the case of spices? And that's where I start because we know where we are with that. If someone come, wakes up you know, one morning and says, ah, I've got a new technology here. I'm going to put some nanopharmacological, some microcapsules or whatever it is mm. uh, into the system that's bound to change it. Then immediately I start, mm -mm, no, well, hang on. That's not what we've done. Mm. So, and the more novel the intervention, the more unknown the consequences. Gotcha. Yeah. And my instinct is always to go back to the oldest way of doing it if we can. Yeah, yeah. And that's by taking it as food or as a concentrate at the best. You know, you, in India, they do use turmeric as a medicine. Yeah, yeah. And in terms of, so we've talked about inflammation, uh, the impact of turmeric being mainly mediated by the microbes that we find in our gut. Um, we can I can understand sort of the leap to longevity in terms of reduce, reducing inflammation, which is you know the foundation of a lot of conditions that I see as a as a doctor in the NHS, whether it's blood pressure, whether it's uh, uh, the risk of cancer, etc. Um, what about weight loss? How yeah. how might turmeric might how might turmeric be helping? With weight loss, is, is this something that you've come across? Or? Yes, and um, well, um, again, again, take a step slightly back uh -huh. because weight loss is follows weight gain, 
And weight gain is often associated with what we call metabolic conditions or metabolic syndrome even. And that, as we know, unfortunately, can be a stepping stone towards prediabetes mm -hmm. and diabetes. So if we can change the way in which the metabolism responds, for example, to having more carbs, more carbohydrates, if we could improve the, if I switch on the furnace a bit so that it burns up these things rather mm. than lets them clog up the system, that would be a step towards improving what we, the metabolism mm. of these things. And the answer is that we got a, a lot of evidence. At Pucca, we've been working on a project to encourage people to increase their spice intake mm. simply uh, to improve their, uh, the, the rest of their diet because we, we, we know wow. we're living particularly in, in our times now, it's very expensive to, to have a fully healthy diet in the way that um, we would ideally want people to have. Um, so if they're having to cope with less ideal foods, can we make them a bit better quality mm. by adding the spices? And the answer is yes. There's a lot of evidence now building up that um, things like cinnamon and ginger, um, nigella, the uh, black seed mm. uh, is another one that comes in fenugreek, I've already mentioned, has evidence of improving metabolic health, the stepping stone to the conversion of carbs into fat. So if you want weight loss, we want to reverse that process. And although there's no quick fix, you know, if I had a quick recipe for weight loss, I mm. wouldn't be sitting here talking to you, Rupert. You'd have to <laughs> video me in the Bahamas somewhere. <laughs> uh, that's still an illusion, isn't it? But to work on the processes that for many people seem to be stuck, they diet, they do this and the other, but the weight is stubborn. Yeah. If we can nudge the metabolism so that it's burning up better and not laying down fat and not putting on weight mm -hmm. then that is uh, the that's the clue and there is real evidence to show that the spices can do that mm. can shift that metabolic control in terms of the quantity of spices that we should be um, getting into our diets every day from a collection of all you know the the variety of them that we have on our supermarket shelves or independence or whatever, what kind of quantities are we are we talking about? I mean, I have I have a ton of spices in my diet. You know, every meal I'm always getting different sort of spices in. But I'm a foodie. You know, I, I love the flavor combinations and all that kind of stuff. I'm probably not your average person. So if I'm thinking about this purely from a functional lens, hmm. what is the general amount in teaspoons that I should be aiming for? Well, the evidence for the metabolic thing I was talking about earlier is in most cases, sort of half a teaspoon a day is oh, that wow. sort of quantity. Wow. Uh, I actually nice. did an a, a infographic uh, with our Pucker campaign in which I put an ordinary, it was a, t a saucer, you mm. know, and a little teaspoon on it, and I just weighed up the quantities of the spices which had shown to have cl significant clinical effects uh -huh. in clinical trials, uh -huh. and they're little spots on the plate. And then I did the picture and I thought on its own that could have been a tablespoon and so, <laughs> so yeah. I got an apple and put it next to it as by contrast right and the apple is a giant yeah yeah. The, the spice piles are very small uh -huh. so it's not a huge quantity that you need wow. so I would say you know if you were to have two or three meals a day that were Middle Eastern Asian uh, with uh, lovely tasting mm. aromatic spices you'd be well on the way. And then if you wanted to make sure, then you can buy supplements, sometimes concentrated supplements of things like turmeric and mm. cinnamon and ginger in the capsule so you can just swallow them. Yeah. And if it's a, if it's the straight herb concentrated, then no problems. Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. In terms of um, the preparations, just bringing it back to turmeric, uh, I'm always asked, you know, is there a difference, first of all, between the different preparations available for something like turmeric, powder, capsules, oils, shots, fresh or, or frozen or whatever? Um, and what would be the desired preparation to take every single day? Start again with what people do, yeah. and that's the powder <coughs> uh, mixed in with the food. Um, dried turmeric is more concentrated than fresh mm. so you've, if with the fresh turmeric you've got slightly more subtle taste but you also need more of it because mm. it hasn't been concentrated 
uh, it's an interesting notion that drying the plant was always the first step to making it a medicine. Ah. And the old word for a dried plant in Middle Europe was drogen. Dro- ah, okay. From whence we get the word drug. So right. those of us who still talk about herbs as medicines talk mm. about them as herbal drugs, and we're very proud of that right. name because that's exactly where it came from. So to make turmeric more medicinal, you should dry it just to get more bang for your buck, more concentration. Mm. Uh, oil is good because, again, that's what people do. They cook it in ghee and they, mm. they, they turn it into an oil-based material, so that's still looking good. Uh, capsules can be a f- concentrated form of the extract, uh, and as long as no one's tinkered with it, you know, and 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 try to do a laboratory conversion on any of it, it's still looking good. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the thing about these things, turmeric especially, it's as tough as old boots. You know, it it can take all sorts of handling. Okay. Yeah. So it's you know, the, look at the dose, the equivalent of its dose in dried form. And you're looking for one to three grams a day would be a good dose of the dried turmeric. Now, if it was the fresh one, you probably need to multiply that, you know, by two or three because the fresh is much more, uh, is much less concentrated. Okay. Um, oils and other shots, uh, you just see, look at the label and see what the equivalent is in terms of the original dried turmeric. Okay, so a general conversion for dry versus fresh is two or three times, is that? Uh, in the case of a root, yes, probably around that. Yeah. If, if it's a fresh leaf or something, it's much more. Oh, okay. See, the, if, if you've ever collected uh, plants, you know, forage them and dry them down, you look, you've had a whole bag and it's concentrated down yeah, to a small. Yeah, think, yeah. Gosh, that's sort of a tenfold increase in yeah. some concentration. Yeah. yeah, so like dried parsley or dried basil, yeah, it, you know, it, you're you going to need a lot more. You need a lot more. Okay, yeah. versus so something like ginger or... Yeah, the roots tend to be more concentrated to start with. Gotcha. In terms of when people are choosing a quality um, powdered form, uh, are there particular things that they should be A, looking out for, and B, follow-up question, how often should you be changing up your spices? Is there a degradation uh, over, over time? Yeah, no, they do. As soon as you powder anything, it starts oxidizing, okay. starts losing its potency. Um, you know, you you do want the freshest possible source. Get the longest sell by if you're if you're uh, buying it in the in the supermarket. If you're ha- buying it loose, nose it. You know, as the name we gave it. You know, mm. you nose it because you can tell if it's feeling fresh. If it's feeling if it smells a bit manky, as we used to say, um, <laughs> then you know, part, move on. Um, so the fresher it is, the better for sure. Uh-huh. Would you try not for like an independent seller when you go for your spices or a supermarket spice is good enough? Uh, well, not necessarily the supermarket spices. You, know, you want a reliable brand and you want something that hasn't been sitting on the shelf for six months already. Okay. So you probably, to be fair, want to go to someone who's got a fairly high throughput. Yeah. Rather go to a, your a little corner shop which has a turmeric that they bought in 2005 or something. You know? Yeah, you yeah. Don't, you, you, you don't want anything that's been sitting around for too long. This is a, a common issue, I think, because a lot of people will, will buy turmeric, let's say, and it will sit at the back of the oh, shelf, yes. because particularly if they don't you yeah. know, cook curries or, yeah. or any sort of uh, foods that have those exotic blends. So if people are thinking about investing in a good quality powdered herb or uh, root, um, how I mean, how often do you change up your spices? I mean, I use it... them up within a couple of months. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, same, <laughs> doesn't same apply. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. No, seriously, <laughs> we've all got stuff in our. I have stuff in my spice cupboard that, <laughs> yeah. frankly, I should keep clearing out because <laughs> if, it's, if it's sitting there for a year or more, it's it's almost certainly lost much of its value. Okay, mm-hmm. but again, knows it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if it's got a good fragrance, if it's got that nice clean aroma, it's probably okay. Especially the more. Uh, aromatic ones yeah um but you will be losing benefit over the months okay okay in that case would there be an argument to say look go for fresh where possible even though it's a little bit less convenient double up the quantities because that's going to be you know what you need for the equivalency of a powdered form um and do it that way if you can do that and be prepared to double up on the dose or more. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or grate it. You know, in, into uh, from, from a fruit. Ginger works 
as we know, yeah. the fresh ginger is so much better than the dry stuff that we were brought up on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the same with turmeric, but you do need more of it. Yeah, the other thing is the staining in your fingers. Although my yeah. mum, um, she gave me a white turmeric uh, a oh, few yeah. months ago, yeah, which I'd never come across before. Are there differences in well, the... Well, uh, uh, just check with your mum. I know we always have to be careful with that, <laughs> but uh, the thing about curcumin is it's yellow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So make sure that the white turmeric isn't curcumin free. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. That's the thing. Uh, actually, I, one of the thoughts I had, I didn't look into white turmeric actually, but it is becoming a lot more popular because of the fact that it doesn't stain your hands. But I wonder if there's a trade off mm. for uh, the actual potency of the product. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm wondering about that. I think it's the same thing with garlic preparations. You know, the fact is that there's the smelly bit, which is actually the yeah. healthy bit. <laughs> yeah. And I think that. Uh, turmeric it's the yellow bit which is the bit that everyone understands I mean to be fair everyone's focused on curcumin yeah but there's scores literally of other interesting looking constituents of turmeric which mm. we barely scratched mm. so the chances are that even with the curcumin free one uh, there will be other um, ingredients and there was a paper written by an Indian scientist that looked at all the benefits of turmeric which are not due to curcumin. Ah, okay. So the prospects are that there are benefits. And this is the thing about plant um, medicines, which is I like, like so much. You know, it's not just one chemical. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. And uh, we scratch the surface only. In terms of people who are taking um, a turmeric preparation a day, so let's say, so my, my, my dad grew up on a farm in Punjab, and it's a very common... Um, drink to have in the morning powdered turmeric or fresh turmeric with a little bit of clarified butter and either mixed in uh, milk that's freshly prepared uh, and uh, produced that morning uh, or hot water um, and then they drink that every single day and then they go to the fields and work and just before anyone decides to you know <laughs> try this uh, you're just going to be aware that it's a very different lifestyle it's not like they're drinking that and sat behind their office desk and typing away they're going out and plowing fields so like having that amount of energy that you're going to get from clarified butter and all the rest of it is going to be rapidly used up in the in the in the morning um, but it's true isn't it that we've got so averse to having fat whereas our predecessors Et fat in vast quantities, same in this country. Yeah. You know, everyone et lard and butter in vast mm. quantities. So, yeah, as you say, it's the physical lifestyle. Yeah. The other thing is, you know, if you've got turmeric shake on your desk, don't, for heaven's sake, spill it. Yeah, 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 <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you don't want to be doing that. But they, they, they would have this, this drink every morning or whatever, and, um, you know, plenty of benefits and stuff. Um, obviously, obviously, some trade offs. If someone was to try and do a similar drink, let's put, let's just say turmeric powdered with hot water every yeah. single day, yeah. are there particular benefits that they would accrue over thirty or sixty days that they could actually uh, feel mm. uh, intuitively? Mm. Are there sort of expectations that you might have? More than that, um, I mean, the, uh, what I get. To it most excited about in my practice, I'm a purple practitioner, mm. is what happens overnight with my remedy. So my standard advice to my patients who are seen for the first time is call me tomorrow because I'm not one of those people who says take this for six months and call in, you know, something may happen. I'm looking for short-term changes. Mm -hmm. And the spices definitely can deliver short-term changes. And it could be simply what happened when you go to the loo next because sometimes they change the the, the constituents of the stool that comes through. Mm. Um, another thing about turmeric, which is one of its really interesting things for me, is that it actually connects with the liver and helps the liver to produce a cleaner, sweeter bile. Now, that's what one of the things the liver does, is it produces bile as part of the uh, helping to digest fats you know, mm. Um, mm. and also to help with digestion generally. And bile is yellow itself. Um, and sometimes when we're looking at a long-term chronic problem, we can see that the liver is some way involved in this because it's in the center of almost everything that goes on in the body. And it's showing its unhappiness. It can't eat too many fats. It doesn't like alcohol. There's all sorts of other things. You feel slightly nauseous. Or, uh, the, uh, oh, the other thing about bile is that it's a laxative. Mm. And so someone is constipated and so on can 
this is a trick that we know in our trade. Uh, you can take all the fiber you like and it's still not working. Mm. One of the mechanisms might be that the liver's producing the wrong sort of bile. Mm. So you're not having that loosening effect. So if that was the case, you know, they could simply report that the next morning I went to the toilet mm. for the first time better than I had. And by the way, it was yellow, you know, and, yeah. and you can immediately see changes um, uh, happening uh, literally overnight. Wow. Uh, and the same with things, I mean, I mentioned that these are heating things and they warm you up. Well, that's within seconds. Um, and so if you've got a cold or an, uh, a head infection or a chest infection um, and you have a mixture of ginger and cinnamon and maybe turmeric as a hot drink with black pepper, take that as a drink uh, when you're feeling cold you can have an effect within seconds, mm, seriously, yeah. mm. effect in seconds. So no, let's not wait around. Yeah, yeah. I definitely have a holiday tea and as uh, one of my um, go-tos whenever I've got like a viral illness or something, and I, I definitely feel the effects. Um, on the subject of the uh, bio, I wonder, are there studies looking at the impact of turmeric uh, taken daily and the impact on digestion or the impact on constipation that you're aware of or the, is this mainly from sort of practice over uh, it, many decades? The, the bile uh, science is pretty uh, bleak. There's not much okay. work going on. It seems to be a latecomer Cinderella in the party, so to speak. Mm. But we know that bile is a major factor in digestive diseases. Mm -hmm bowel inflammation, mm. irritable bowel itself can be uh, the wrong sort of bile being irritating. It can, if, if, you, if the liver is producing the wrong stuff in the bile, it can upset your bowel and make it more crampy, more bloaty. It can be the source of gas and so mm. on. Uh, so there's all sorts of ways in which you can point the finger upstream uh, to the bile and the liver. But, you know, it's the effect of taking some of the remedies that work at that level and their effect on the gut. Yeah. That, that's your answer um, yeah. to, the, to your question. Um, can you see an effect? Is, do you see that change in the bowel? That's usually good enough yeah. for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, in terms of um, the, pre you mentioned earlier uh, the, the effect of turmeric on the microbes in the gut. And we, we were talking a bit about the microbiota there. Turmeric has a prebiotic effect, right? Yes. Can we talk a bit more about what a prebiotic is yes. and what that prebiotic effect actually manifests as? This is a really fascinating bit because there are things that are confusing names. You have probiotics, mm -hmm. you have prebiotics. Probiotics are yogurts and things that uh, you add living bacteria in the mm. hope that some of it gets through the stomach and on to the other side. And there's a quite a growing bit of evidence, and a lot of it is not supported mm. uh, because the stomach's job is to sterilize. So, you know, there's, a, there's an uphill struggle for something that's living to mm. be swallowed, but some of it gets through and there is some evidence. So the probiotic is the living thing. Mm -hmm. And you think of it like adding seed to the if we think of the microbiome as a garden, mm. a living organism, which it is, uh, and it's, think of it as like the soil. So you add seed, that's the probiotics, the yogurts, the fermented foods and the supplements. Um, prebiotics are the equivalent of the soil itself. You know, they are the, um, the, the, that's the material on which the living organisms in your gut thrive on. And prebiotics essentially are vegetables and cereals, um, plants. They mm. are the ones, the fiber-rich plants are your main prebiotics. So root vegetables are well known. Some of the seeds, some of the cereals, mm -hmm. uh, a muesli is full of uh, prebiotics. Turmeric and I mentioned these polyphenols, the, the, the key ingredients in, in plants, are themselves prebiotics. And some of the most exciting work on turmeric is its prebiotic effects mm. and the same with cinnamon and ginger so they those constituents do seem to feed the microbiome but here's the really interesting bit because there's another category we've talked about probiotics prebiotics we now talk about postbiotics mm. and those are what happens when the microbiome has had its uh, effects 
it produces these, we talked about them before, some of these more active constituents. It's a, that, that, that they're actually a consequence of the microbiome. So they're after digestion, postbiotics. And we understand that polyphenols generally from plants, but also spices, particularly turmeric, are likely to engage in this conversation that goes on down there between our healthy bacteria and our gut wall and the rest of us. And they engage in what we call crosstalk between these players. And that is a postbiotic effect. And that's where the smart thinking is now moving. Mm. So we've got prebiotics, probiotics, postbiotics. And it looks as though the spices are postbiotics. Yeah, that's super interesting. And it, I, I guess it begs the question to me, in the same way we're seeing how some people can extract more readily the benefits of certain pharmaceuticals if they have a well-functioning gut microbiota, I wonder if the same would be for somebody taking uh, spices. Is a person who has a healthy microbiota, i.e. a rich, diverse uh, selection of bacteria, fungi, nematodes, viruses down there in their gut, are going to have more benefits for taking turmeric versus yeah. somebody else who That's is perhaps dysbiotic? That's a really dysbiotic. good question, yeah. There was a paper just published just the other day which looked at the microbiome of hunter-gatherers mm. and... Um, uh, farmers and Californians. Okay. <laughs> and you wouldn't be too surprised to know that the Californians had the least number yeah. diversity of organisms living in their gut. Uh, the, the Nepalese farmers had about twice as many uh -huh. uh, microbiomes, but the hunter gatherers still living in yeah. the very ancient way of living had twice as many again. Wow. Uh, so we've lost a lot of diversity through simply modern life. Interestingly, the microbiome of the Californians had become adapted to deal with what we call oxidative stress, in other words, inflammation. Ah. So it's almost as though our microbiome had changed yeah. to adapt to the mad world that we live in. And as I said to my colleague, what we now need is microbiomes to adapt to con eat microparticles of plastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's what we want. We want yeah. our microbiome to be intelligent and yeah, to start yeah. adapting to save us from all this world. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, Loss of diversity is probably one of the most insidious problems we have in the modern world because uh -huh. you're right, the microbiome, the healthy microbiome is the one that's the most diverse. Mm. And I had a presentation which is called Rewilding Our Inner Garden, which mm. is about looking for ways of making that diversity, increasing that diversity. I love that term, rewilding. Yeah. It's fascinating. It's, and I, I, I actually put up turmeric as the, one of the star players in that because I think that the promise is that an Asian diet with lots of these spices yeah. is actually going to build mm. our microbiome against all those consequences. Uh, one of the, uh, I'm at a conference here um, and I'm talking about antibiotic resistance. Mm. Uh, and we know all the problems about too many antibiotics and so on and uh, losing their effect and so on. But one of the obvious problems with antibiotics is that they deplete your microbiome. So if we can find ways of reducing our need for antibiotics, that's another way of reducing that mm. depletion. Yeah, that burden, absolutely. And I guess we've had a, a, a bunch of infectious disease consultants talking about the negative impact of antimicrobials, not even ones that we're taking, but just consuming as a result of our food system, what we're the exposed animals, to. Uh, the uh, antibiotics that animals get fed and so on, yeah. Yeah, exactly, and our waterways and stuff. So it's kind of scary times, but interesting to know that we can potentially improve the rewilding of our microbiota with, with these different spices. And I guess, you know, the last time we talked, about a year ago, you were on a mission to add spices to sort of you know, the eat well plates or the pyramids or whatever they're called around the world these days in as a as a way of improving people's nutrient density in yeah. a cheaper effective affordable yeah. manner what where are you on that on the stage we of just that we've been kicking off with the political consultants we're looking okay. at how to make the changes we need we're, we're producing what we call a we, you know you've heard white papers which are sort of yeah. policy papers we're producing a rainbow paper okay. which, <laughs> yeah. uh, which which actually puts out all the evidence i was talking about yeah and it's all about metabolic health actually the evidence so yeah that's diabetes and other weight and other things seems to be where things are going yeah and you know we actually put together a list of uh, some images of 
meals for less than a pound, oh, right. which could be transformed by just adding one of the one of the spices, gotcha. make it more tasty, yeah. but also likely more yeah. healthy as well. So we're sort of putting the pieces together so that it, mm. we can begin to persuade people this is a cheap, yeah, and b effective yeah. way of improving what goes on down there. Yeah, yeah, mm. and I guess you know before people start running out and buying as many different versions of turmeric they can get their hands on, you just type in turmeric. Uh, into internet and into, into Google or on YouTube, or whatever you look at uh, various videos, and you'll see all these different claims, these different benefits about how it's going to improve brain health and erectile dysfunction and kill cancer cells and all the rest of it. Like, as, as a doctor, that's quite hard for me to um, promote or get, get my head around because I think that kind of messaging can have a dangerous side, as exactly. I'm sure you can imagine. Exactly. When you see all these different claims online, well, how, how, do you, how do you approach it? Well, the louder the claim, the further I back away. That's <laughs> my, uh, yeah. my first policy. Um, we were talking about mechanisms um, yeah. before. You know, mm. the turmeric does this and the gut, it does this to the circulation. And these are, the, these are very plausible mechanisms for improving some of the things you just mentioned. Mm. I mean, you know, we talk about dementia now as diabetes th uh, 3, you know, mm. uh, uh, type 3 diabetes, um, because the link between dementia and metabolic problems is increasingly clear. Mm. We know that turmeric does get to some of the mechanisms that get to your brain when you're when it's beginning to break down with Alzheimer's or dementia. So there's there's a plausibility there. Uh, we know that erectile dysfunction is a circulatory problem. We know that turmeric does get to the small blood vessels. So there's a mechanism there. Yeah. So none of that is ruled out. Mm. But there's, that's not the same as saying, I'm going to sell you the supplement for your erectile dysfunction. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. it's all in the there's lots of steps along the way yeah yeah there are plausible indirect mechanisms that can support some of what people might think around it but it's it's quite hard to dive into the literature and actually find ratified evidence exactly. for some of these yeah. um, practices and it's partly because people aren't looking can't haven't been paid to look because all yeah. these things are very expensive yeah. and we can all wish for and do wish for a much more robust research policy which looks at some of the things we've been talking about yeah more closely but you know there's not a patent to be got out of turmeric yeah uh, there might be if you made a nano pharmacological preparation yeah but um turmeric itself is cheap as houses and cheap as chips shall yeah. we say and uh, no one's going to make a bean by putting millions of pounds into a clinical trial yeah right? and this is a government policy yeah so we're always going to be short of good research yeah so I come back to the fact that you know people like myself actually see patients and use these things and see mm -hmm. changes sometimes dramatic changes sometimes overnight uh, or certainly in the short term um, and you know for the moment that's all we can do mm. uh, but yeah I avoid the loud claims mm. simply because it's mostly hot air yeah yeah in terms of the the selection of other herbs and spices that we have out there obviously turmeric's having a moment because it's relatively well researched compared yes. to everything else there's yes. tons of studies on it um lots of people are excited about the supplement as it relates to cancer prevention yes bowel cancer um uh, and bowel and cancer by the way there's there really is strong pointers and it comes back to what the fact that that's where it's working mm. and also the effect on the bile which is one of the co-carcinogens in bowel cancer gotcha yeah so are there other herbs or spices that we've sort of like forgotten about that you want to pump up so to speak yeah well, absolutely get, get yes. people sort of as excited <laughs> let's about. pump up yes yeah yeah <laughs> well ginger always he steps up right okay. ahead the uh -huh. most valuable commodity in human history weight for weight is oh, really? being dry ginger yeah really that's oh, why wow. the reasons why the brits and the portuguese and the uh, french and uh, the spanish all headed off uh, was to find the spices and ginger being the top one wow. and you know, I think I told you this last year but it was made extinct in the wild 2,000 years ago so all the ginger we've had ever since has had to be grown from rootstock because yeah. it doesn't seed itself anymore yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that is because even 2,000 years ago people realized how valuable it was and they just plundered it mm. so 
Ginger is right up there at the top of the tree in terms of just a wow factor. Uh, and it's hot and it gets the circulation going and fights, helps you to fight uh, viral things simply because of that. Um, mm. My favourite, as I said earlier, my favourite um, uh, remedy for a common cold is ginger with cinnamon mm. uh, as a tea. Hit straight away. No, it instantly. Yeah. Which leads us on to cinnamon, which is the other big fella, and a lot of work on metabolism, on blood sugar, and all those other things coming in. A mm -hmm. uh, couple of ones hiding in the shadows. My personal favourite is cardamom. Uh -huh. It's in the same category as warming spice, mm. but it's traditionally used particularly for when you're feeling run down in here, in, mm. in your digestion. Mm -hmm. You've been ill for a while, you're fatigued, you need a bit of building. Mm. Um, cardamom just piles in the warmth and the support and it does all the sort of thing I'm pretty sure it does what we've been saying about turmeric as well yeah. works on the microbiome so you know plug for cardamom mm -hmm. uh, nigella the black seed um, is one that's used in Arabic uh, cultures a lot uh, you see that uh, uh, that in food um, that is a lot of evidence actually to mm. show uh, effects on inflammation, on circulation, and so on. Uh, saffron, very valuable, of course, and expensive, but you don't need much of it. Mm -hmm. um, another yellow yeah. in your meal. Um, quite a lot of evidence show for that, too. N Nigella seed I use a lot, actually, in cooking. Yeah. Wonderful flavour, yeah. aromatic, not too spicy for people but who... But hardly anyone knows about it. Yeah, 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 I yeah. know. So it's a you sort big of... it up, too, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a sort of flavour <laughs> that people can't... Put their finger on but they recognize and they're like there's something about this dish or preparation or whatever it is um that is nice it's almost sweet yes um uh, but it's uh yeah it's not many people know how to use it let's let's have a nigella campaign uh, yeah yeah <laughs> it's got a nice name we've got a nice chef to confront yeah, that one. yeah exactly exactly um, uh, so that's a fenugreek i mentioned earlier yeah. which is not so much a spice it's almost a food but it's uh -huh. um again it's got spice qualities it's got that uh -huh. flavor isn't it yeah um, yeah um uh, so that's up there. Uh, cumin, mm -hmm. again, Middle Eastern, uh, Persian, uh, and India also uh, widely used. I love that flavor, mm. but also is stepping up to be quite a powerful remedy. You know, I think if you just look at the spice cupboard, you're going to find yeah. potential yeah. almost anywhere there. Are there um, particular spices that you use for people who experience bloating? I mean, obviously, there are plenty of different reasons as to why people might experience bloating or digestive discomfort, you know, ranging from the severe and the red flags of, mm -hmm. you know, growths and, mm -hmm. and uh, inflammatory disorders down to, you know, you've eaten too fast or you've been eating and walking. Mm -hmm. uh, people don't realize that they don't chew their food properly. You know, sometimes it's very, air. Yeah, yeah, and swallowing air and, and or like, you know, eating disturbed and like, you know, watching yeah. TV and stuff, which I'm guilty of as well sometimes. Um, are there certain preparations with herbs or spices that you use for, for, for those common complaints? Well, one of the ones we haven't mentioned already, uh, one of the ones that is particularly used for colic and gas and so on, the gut is fennel. Yeah. Uh, and indeed in China, they use high doses of fennel for quite severe gut problems. Mm. Um, and it's, you need to be careful about having it too much too because there's some downsides of having a lot of fennel too often and too much but you know for average consumption go for it what what's the downside of uh, well it's yeah. got a carcinogen in it um which you know people have tut tutted about various regulatory agencies that uh, is one that's quite commonly encountered in food mm -hmm. um uh, estragol but it's you need a lot of fennel for a lot of time so we're slightly cautious about saying taking bucket loads of it okay but in the ordinary everyday consumption no one's going to limit your con use of it in cooking and so on so like one and certainly for short-term use if you've got a bloating yeah just if you know you can buy a fennel tea bag i'm you know obviously mentioned pucker and <laughs> yeah. and death, but there are <laughs> other brands available yeah um make a tea uh, not one Try one, see if that feels good. Because whenever you're trying a herb or spice or tea, no one can tell you what how good it's going to be until you've tried it yourself. Because uh -huh. everyone is different. Yeah. Um, so try the fennel. If it feels good, with one tea bag, leave it in for 15 minutes, by the way, because you really want to draw. 15 minutes. Yeah, okay. at least, because uh -huh. you want to draw out the goodness. Gotcha. But then if one feels okay, then put two. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. 
uh, waiting for Pucker to say, yeah, add three. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you might need to build up the dose a bit. Could you just use fennel seeds, crush them, yes, and pestle and mortar? Yes, you can. Yeah. And, yeah, if you get the seeds, use a little mortar, pestle yeah. thing, just so you bruise them a bit. Yeah. If you don't have one of those, just roll with a rolling pin or bash them with a spoon, just so you crack the seeds a bit, yeah. just so that it gets the goodness out of them. Okay. Uh, we talked about individual differences. I mean... We haven't mentioned Chile, which of mm. course is not Asian, it's North American. Mm. And inter interestingly, it was Columbus who thought he was taking a shortcut to the Spice Islands who bumped into America uh -huh. and saw another spice which they hadn't found before, Cayenne, uh -huh. Chile. Uh, and people, very, you know, they're, 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 it's, a, it's a Marmite, isn't it? So some people like yeah. it, some people really can't take it. Yeah. Um, and often it's the stomach that says, mm -mm, mm. don't want this. And if, you're what you, if you know you're one of those, don't go there. Mm. But if you can take a bit of chilli, if you like a bit of cayenne um, or paprika, which is the gentler form, that can really make a difference to gas and really? bloating. Yeah. Oh, no. But again, it depends on whether it suits you yeah. or not. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I haven't heard of that one. Yeah. I, I know what you mean. Like We've got a number of recipes on our app that have cayenne pepper in. Simple, some people absolutely love it. Other people can't even take a half teaspoon of it. Yeah. You know, and for a serving of three or four yeah. people, and we we get you know, some messages like, "Oh, I use the cayenne; it's way too yeah. much." No, when I'm talking with patients, they I'll say, "Do you like spices?" And they'll say, "No, as to and I say, no, not, not chili. I meant I meant the other ones. Yeah, yeah, They're the more aromatic, the softer ones." And they will agree that even a bit of ginger is fine. It's, yeah. it's chili that they mean when they talk about the spice. What about some of the softer ones like rosemary and sage and basil? The, the herbals. Like, yeah, yes. the herbals. Yeah. Yes. Well, they're it's interesting. There's much less evidence. Oh, for them. Really? Oh, rosemary really? is one that's sort of standing up a bit. Uh -huh. And remember, Shakespeare said rosemary for remembrance. Mm. That's, he had Ophelia say that in Hamlet. And that was reflecting a long tradition of everyone knowing that it went to your brain because all you have to do is smell it for heaven's sake. You know, you just crush a leaf mm. and the get, you know, the, the oil, the aroma seems to go straight to your head. Mm. And there's evidence to show that's exactly what it does. So it's a very promising remedy for cognitive problems and we've actually i was involved i set up a clinical trial looking at rosemary for cognitive in elderly people in in the usa oh wow and uh it, it was a there was a few methodological problems we didn't quite get the dosing right but there was quite a trend that people perform better on their sort of high speed tests and yeah. so on with taking the rosemary than not and there's more support of that coming in so we can think of rosemary for the for for the brain yeah uh, in eastern asia and uh, sorry eastern europe uh, they use it for the liver uh, and there's quite good reasons for, to think that too um, and uh, you know increasingly i use it when there is sort of some circulatory inflammatory issue it seems to be quite a promising one so rosemary definitely mm. uh, time we usually think of most for coughs and reducing uh, tight children particularly mm -hmm. coughs very good for that uh, again another digestive remedy but the evidence again is a bit scanty very okay. scanty yeah sage we think of for the throat and sometimes uh, women find it helpful going through the change oh okay yeah. uh-huh uh-huh and uh, in terms of the preparations for those uh, in my head I'm, th I'm thinking of the easiest way which is get some hot water and dunk in your your leaves yeah. uh, or your stalks or whatever swish them around for a few minutes and then drink more the... than a few minutes yeah more... <laughs> is that, and is chop, that... And chop them up finely as well okay chop them up finely. yeah okay. because uh -huh. you want to get the stuff out from the leaf don't okay. you so if you put a whole branch in there you, yeah it's not going to get it so you chop it up finely uh -huh. um, and you soak it for a while and so. how much are we talking a couple of stalks or well the old-fashioned approach used to be an ounce in the old, old language yeah uh, an ounce of dried herbs to a pint of hot water an ounce of dry herbs to a pint of this and that sounds like quite a bit. That's quite a bit. Yeah, that and is. And we sometimes refer to that as heroic dose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because you're meant to eat that in a day. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, wow. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what we, when you really want the health benefits to shine through. Okay. It's a, it's a good point. You know, uh -huh. in the old days, we didn't have ambulances and hospitals and men in white coats or women in white coats or dungarees rushing around <laughs> taking your temperature. You had... You, you were on your own in a farmhouse somewhere mm. and you got ill you needed to fix it mm. you, otherwise you you weren't going to get through 
So heroic doses are what you needed to move from today to tomorrow. So those are the heroic doses, an ounce to a pint per day. <laughs> um, yeah, so back down from there. So we've got a few sort of t uh, tips for people who are having bloating issues with fennel uh, and, and the like. If I'm trying to create a tincture to take before I do a podcast, let's say, mm -hmm. and I want to make sure that I'm on top of my game and I'm firing on all cylinders and I'm cognitively aware, rosemary sounds like a go-to. Put that in there. Anything else? Well, that obviously, prefer? if you can find a space and tincture without staining it to put the turmeric in yeah, there. Yeah, okay, yeah. turmeric, yeah. <laughs> uh, if you're feeling at all under the weather, you know, tired, knack knackered, cardamom I'd always okay. put in there. Yeah, it makes it taste nicer as well. Uh, I think you should start a product um, that's got all this stuff in. And you we know. should shout from the rooftops is going to cure this, <laughs> that, and the other, and completely, uh, uh, completely deny everything. We've yeah, just been yeah, saying. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that sounds great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try my hand at creating some um, rosemary-based tinctures. Uh, but seriously, Ruby, the yeah. the thing about all of this is that it is at hand. Uh huh. Anyone can do this uh -huh. for very little money. Mm. You don't, and you can gather your rosemary just by walking through any park. You can find rosemary yeah. there. Um, uh, these things are cheap. You can do them yourself, like everybody did in the old days. You don't need to pay shed loads. Yeah, on yeah. subs. It sure reminds me. I uh, I was walking back from the supermarket just a few weeks ago, actually, and I'd bought a bunch of herbs. One of them was rosemary. And I walked back through the park and there was a rosemary bush that I found. <laughs> and I literally paid like 80p for like the small bag of and rosemary. Just and actually, I should have, there's a huge well, bush Well, don't let the park keeper see you. But, yeah, yeah. And remember. And don't get the ones near the floor. Near the, the floor. I was going to say the dog. Effect, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Above dog height. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This has been brilliant. Look, uh, I, I love your work. I love the campaign that you're putting together to get more herbs and spices into people's diet. I think it's a really important uh, um, oversight that we've had on, on improving the nutrient density of, of meals. Um, so yeah, like uh, I look forward to having more of these chats in the future well, where that's... hopefully we can catch up on, on where you're at with that. Well, as I usually say, why am I doing this? It actually makes everything more fun. Yeah. It makes food more fun. It certainly makes healthcare more fun yeah absolutely absolutely if you enjoyed that video you'll love the library of content that we have on the doctorskitchen.com make sure you hit subscribe and we have podcasts in our library on brain health well-being supplements and lots more have a wonderful day